Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so it's nice to meet you all. I would love for this talk to be as interactive as possible, but um, I also know it's like noontime and sometimes it's nice to kind of sit there and listen. But um, I just have some polling in there, and but I also want you all to feel free to chime in, interrupt me, um, just, you know, I'm assuming you'll be unmuted the conference room. So feel free to just like raise your hand or interrupt me um, and ask questions, or please share your background info on those of you who have experience in this topic. Also. So I'm one of the faculty in the Department of Family Medicine. And I'm also co-chair of our um, racial justice com uh, committee for change, racial justice curricular reforms committee. And so I've been doing work around anti-racism and um, race medicine research for the past few years and our direct patients population and policy course for our preclinical students. So by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to define race explain the history of race-based classifications and the problematic use of racialized medicine, identify inappropriate use in clinical care, demonstrate how it can neg negatively impact patient care and what you can do to prevent it, and if we have time, we'll practice the skills of practically phasing out racial terminology without context. Um, so why is this important? Um, the misuse of race in medicine has led to misdiagnoses, inappropriate treatments, and blatant inequities in health outcomes. So it's why it's so important for us as faculty, for you as residents, and our medical students to understand how race is defined, recognize the role of race in medicine, and be able to mitigate the racist underpinnings. And here to the side are just two books. Um, if you haven't read them, I highly recommend them. Medical Apartheid, I'm sure you've heard of, and Fatal Invention. Um, is now, as of last summer, required reading for our incoming M1 medical students. We assign three chapters, and then during orientation, we have small groups and discussions around race and medicine, around this topic we're, we're talking about right now. Um, I just want to open up and talk about um, my, you know, being vulnerable and willing to learn. I'm learning along with each of you. Uh, I was like looking through some of my patient notes from a few years ago, and you know, using, we're going to talk about this, but, you know, using a racial identifier in the opening line, something I do all the time, um, using race corrections in clinical practice, like EGFR, used for years without even thinking about it. Um, if, you know, if I, if I look at my patients, they are African-American or non-African-American. Um, when I first joined this faculty about some years ago, I remember we had a homelessness panel we had set together, and um, we were short speakers, but still not realizing that in front of a class of 200 medical students putting forward to black male patients for homeless and white female doctor, how I was perpetuating stereotypes around race. And then I worked at Unity Clinic um, after my fellowship in community health at Georgetown. Um, I worked at Unity Clinic providing primary care for a few years. And there's so many times where I just didn't fully understand why so many of my patients were so averse to invasive medical procedures, even if they're life-saving. So I just want to say, I, I mean, I've been learning the last few years, but I still have a lot more learning to do. So we're kind of all in this together. And I'm assuming many of you got more of this than I did when I was in medical school or got more around these topics, hopefully. So I just wanted to start off with a brief poll. If it's okay, this is anonymous. So, so far we have about um, half of you sitting on all, and then um, the other one's split between very little, very little and moderate. So thank you to those of you who took the poll. Um, so, you know, the, what we're going to go over, the answer is there's actually no biological or genetic basis for race. Um, but the fact that so many of us are unsure of that is not really our fault. It's, the, it's what we've been taught throughout medical school. So I want to give the COVID mortality example. Um, we all know, I mean, these, some of these numbers are from last year, but the bottom line being that Black and Indigenous Americans have had the highest death tolls from COVID. Um, you know, in, in all areas throughout the U.S. Um, and if you look at D.C. and bring it home, Black residents represent about 44% of the population have represented 74% of deaths from COVID. So that's a big disparity. We had one of our senior medical deans who said this last, last spring, I thought the disproportionate impact of COVID on African-Americans was because of some unknown genetic predisposition. I learned that wasn't true after I heard Dr. Fauci discuss socioeconomic factors as underlying cause. And I heard this from so many other colleagues like throughout or saw statements like this. So there's something about our medical education and medicine where we've been taught to believe there is a genetic or biological difference between races. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about. So to start off, what do we know about race? 
Race is a social and political construct. It's a created set of categories based on arbitrary physical attributes like skin color, facial features, hair color. There's no biological basis. There's multiple studies showing there's more genetic variation within any given racial ethnic group than between ethnic groups. And the Human Genome Project showed us that race cannot be identified in our genes. And there's like a quote from Bill Clinton in 2000 saying, um, you know, this, this is a huge achievement because it shows that we're 99.9% .9 genetically similar across, across everybody. But race has been employed by humans to exert privilege and power over one another for thousands of years. So when we go back and look at history and kind of how we got to where we are now, um, this is a quote from Dorothy Roberts, who wrote the book I mentioned to you that the medical students read. Um, race is not a biological category that is politically charged. It's a political one that has been disguised as a biological one. Um, this is one of the definitions of race, where it's a specious classification of human being created by Europeans which ensigns worth and social status using white as the model of humanity and the height of achievement. And then we all know, obviously, about the slave trade that happened in our country, um, and it was a legal, economic, and social institution. And what I want to point out, though, is that it was based on and justified by this constructive belief that there are biological differences between black and white people. So race in US history. So why was race kind of around biology and revolution in America? because we're a country that was founded on justice and liberty for all and the only way to really get around that and have slavery at the same time was to make race an innate fixed biological characteristic that couldn't be changed but if you really look at race in our country who qualifies as white black indian has changed over time every decade the u.s census racial categories have changed since 19 since 1790 the first one had free white male free white female all other persons and slaves and this was under race. Um, mulatto at one point was was grouped along with any individual who had even one drop of black blood was uh, grouped under the black race. And at different periods, Hispanic and Latino populations were considered white, while Irish families were not. So as you can see, the way race has been defined has been more social, political, legal, um, not not based on any scientific or biological studies. When you look at medical texts through history. You can see the same trends though, how race is defined in terms of biology. So diseases were defined arguing that individuals of different races were more prone to unusual diseases or experienced common diseases differently. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, Hippocrates, we all take the oath um, in his writings, elevated the hardy European races and denigrated the feeble Asiatic races. Benjamin Rush, who was one of the most well-known physicians in the 18th century, talked about how black skin color was due to some form of leprosy which could be cured and returned to the normal or healthy white color and even um in the early 1900s this is um from an ob textbook written by dr williams who's the dean of hopkins school of medicine says it appears that colored children weigh considerably less than white a fact that in large cities at least is indicative of the physical degeneration which characterizes the race so again tying race together with these biological characteristics um along with that you have medicine which exploited race and i could do a whole separate lecture on this topic and i'm sure you've heard most of these but i wanted to just highlight some examples for those of you who maybe haven't been um, as exposed to this if dr sims who's known as the father of modern gynecology who believed that black people didn't experience pain like white people and that's why he performed, he perfected his vaginal um, fistula techniques on black enslaved women without their consent and without anesthesia. And then the picture up at the top is Anarcha, Lucy, and Betsy, who are now considered the mothers of modern gynecology. Um, another physician who was pretty prominent in the mid 1800s, Dr. Cartwright, he was a plantation physician who owned slaves. Um, he was also a self proclaimed professor of diseases of the Negro. So he did a study on his enslaved um, black, um, black, I guess, uh, participants and then white free participants and claimed that black people have lower lung capacity and that that's why slavery was good for them because it helped with their lung capacity. And we're gonna talk about how he still has a footprint in modern medicine today with our barometer. Um, 1916, Dr. Welsh, another Dean of Hopkins School of Medicine, 
founded Hopkins School of Public Health, was a huge advocate of eugenic scholarship, which is basically the science to do controlled breeding to increase the current desirable heritable characteristics to improve the human population. And the desirable characteristics are, of course, Anglo-Saxons and Euro Northern Europeans. And the ones that were under the characteristics that were undesirable were Africans, Eastern um, European immigrants, um, and Asiatic races. And then the Tuskegee study in the early 1900s, which you've all I'm sure heard of, but what I want to point out here is the reason they created the study. It was launched by the US Public Health Service, but they created it to explore this belief that, again, black bodies and white bodies are different. So the hypothesis was that in black um, individuals, syphilis affected um, their cardiovascular system because it bypassed their underdeveloped brains, whereas in whites, it affected their neurological system. And so this whole horrible study was based on, um, on this thought that, again, race is biological. Um, there was pushback from thinkers, sociologists, anthropologists, W.E. Du Bois and Francois, who really worked hard towards halting the teaching of race as biological, but did not have any success in the fields of science and medicine. And so those thoughts perpetuated um, throughout American medicine. Um, Okay, I'll do this side and then I'll ask any questions. So excluding physicians based on race. So on top of all these beliefs around white bodies, black bodies, bodies of color being different, um, physicians were also excluded based on race. So the AMA played a large role in this, for which recently they've actually apologized, but huge impact. So from the 1870s and 1960s, the AMA allowed all states and local chapters to practice racial exclusion in their memberships. So basically, most African-American physicians were excluded from AMA membership, which had big implications. And the other big thing was the Flexner Report, which I'm not sure if you've heard of, but Abraham Flexner went and um, evaluated medical schools across the country for the Carnegie Foundation and, and put together a report. And based on very strict standards and criteria on what um, he felt a good and appropriate medical education is. And um, because of his report, 52 medical schools were closed down by not meeting the standards. But the big, big, big impact was that five of seven historically black medical schools were closed and only two that stayed open were Meharry and Howard. And so that really closed the doors to so many African-Americans from medical institutions and also affected our African-American patients who then did not have um, black physicians taking care of them. And um, I feel like I can't talk about the history without bringing up something about redlining because when we look at inequities and disparities, um, this, this plays the biggest role. And I have DC map here. So this was practiced throughout the early 1930s, but basically it was discriminatory practices by banks, insurance companies, where they would refuse for loans and mortgages um, or insurances within specific geographic areas. And basically it was in areas where there are higher numbers of non-white people. And you can see how they're labeled here where there's red or pink, they were G, F, G, or H. And those were like the lowest grades. And you can see how it defined, they define it here on the left. It said showing effects of Negro occupancy. Um, and then H areas were developed, especially for Negroes, or have been left open for Negroes to build for themselves. So basically between 1934 and 1962, 98% of the loans that the FHA insured went to white borrowers. Um, this had huge implications. Um, millions of Black, Asian, Hispanic, Jewish, and immigrant families were a few housing loans, and that played a role for generations to come in terms of generational wealth, in terms of investment in communities, and um, kind of the disparities we see today. I think you all know this, what health inequities are, systematic differences in the opportunities that groups have to achieve optimal health, leading to unfair and avoidable differences in health outcomes. And if you look at this study by Aileen Krieger, I mean, you look across races and you look at all of these outcomes and you'll see there's a um, pretty significant difference um, between, especially in our Black and Native American populations with having um, worse health outcomes and large health inequities. And I'm sure you've all seen this diamond figure where you look at the wards where we're in at Georgetown, right? Um, one, two, and three, and then you see wards seven and eight on the right, primarily um, Black individuals, Black communities, whereas wards one, two, and three are white. And then you'll see these outcomes all the time where there'll be higher incarceration rates, persistent poor health, poverty, and wards seven and eight. 
and you'll see charts like this where it, the life expectancy is compared between um, the wards. You'll see the income difference, education difference. And the thing is, um, a lot of times we present these stats and we don't talk about the background that we just talked about. And so students and faculty and clinicians walk away thinking, oh, there must be some genetic difference uh, between these residents in Ward 8 who are primarily Black and those in Ward 3. But um, as you just saw, it relates back to so many other systemic factors. Um, but I, before I go on to racism in medicine today, and we're going to talk about race a little bit more specifically, I just want to stop and see if anybody has any um, feedback or questions or anything you want to say before we go on. No. Okay. Um, so we know that there's still racism in medicine today. We went from historic abuse to more like biological and sociological mo models of discrimination. But when you put the data, like I just showed you, the difference in life expectancy between the wards, um, people fall on biological or behavioral explanations for disparities. Oh, they just don't eat as healthy, or um, those communities um, just don't exercise or whatnot. But they don't um, end up considering the destructive effects of systemic racism, including chronic stress. The other big part of it is where the money goes in terms of research, right? So if you look at NIH funded studies from 1994 to 2005, um, there's 22,000 studies investing in genomics, 1,300 of those discussed race, genes, and disease. So all these like researchers are keep trying to find the link between race and genetics um, and haven't been able to. And only 44 explored the connection between health, racism, and racial discrimination. So the funding just isn't going to that. So without understanding what race is and thinking it's biological, it increases physician implicit bias, propagates racial stereotypes and contributes to worse patient outcomes. Um, some of you might be looking at me right now and saying, you know what, Dr. Kreshi, that's that's like stuff in the past. You know, it's really different for us nowadays and in our healthcare system, it's not like that. But um, there are studies that show these beliefs have been institutionalized into our healthcare system. So one of the studies that came out in 2016 basically surveyed general lay people, first and second year medical students and residents, white, um, white, identified white individuals who they surveyed. And this is in 2016. And if you look at the percentages here, um, you can look at the general, but even look at the first and second year medical students. If you look at uh, black skin is thicker than white, 58% of them surveyed believe that. 40% all the way to 25% of residents believe that black skin is thicker than whites or that black people's blood coagulates more quickly than whites, or blacks' nerve endings are less sensitive than whites. So unfortunately, these beliefs have been institutionalized in the healthcare system. I found another study from 2018 that just talked about stereotyping um, across intersections of race and age, and this was um, looking at white adults who work with children. And the big takeaway is high proportions of these adults who work or volunteer with children endorsed negative stereotypes, so being lazy, violent, own unintelligent unhealthy habits, especially towards Black, but also other ethnic minorities. So again, this is uh, for people, medical students, residents, childcare workers in 2016 and 2018. So this is why we still have to talk about this today. Um, this was something I had read actually recently. Uh, I've been giving this workshop to faculty for the last year, but this was something I just came across a few months ago. Um, this article is from June, but even the NFL has this race norming, um, race norming practice where they basically, um, when they settle lawsuits based on concussions of NFL football players, there is a different standard for white players and black players. So basically, the difference is um, the baseline cognitive function of black players. They and their and their algorithm is lower than for white players. So black players are less likely to win any lawsuits um, for any traumatic brain injury. Or whatnot, um, because of again this belief that the NFL has used that they're reversing it now, but that black brains are different cognitively from white brains. So it's really in all parts of our society, but I've been focusing more on medicine. So big, big these are big picture takeaways: racism in medicine today. I'm sure most of you know this, but I feel like it still needs to be said. Huge um, inequities. In, in outcomes, but also in care. So black people, especially women, are recommended for cardiac catheterization less than white people. And that's the studies, if study is if you hold other if you control for other things. 
Black women currently experience significantly higher maternal morbidity and mortality than white women. That's even when you control for socioeconomic factors. Um, multiple studies showing this one, I only put one in here, but there's multiple. Black Americans are systematically undertreated for pain relative to white Americans. Um, there was one study, and this is even in kids, that Black and Latinos are twice as likely, um, patients are twice as likely to receive no pain medication as whites for the same painful long bone fractures. And then we know that in adulthood, Black individuals have higher death rates than white persons for most of the leading causes of death. In the current example we talked about with COVID mortality. Um, I screenshot this slide. Um, there was an endocrinologist giving a lecture last year on YouTube. So the link is there. But I just thought that this was a really good graph. Oftentimes when we talk and we present things, we look at the bottom line. We look at the disparate health outcomes and just talk about epidemiological stats, about uh, diabetes is higher in this population or that population. But I think anytime you hear stats like that, um, it's really important to look Think about, remember this chart, and think about all of the things, all of the upstream factors, going all the way back to slavery and eugenics and the closure of medical schools, um, experimentation on vulnerable groups, and then redlining, which we talked about. Um, and then bias. So you can see that leading to these disparate health outcomes, if you understand the larger context, you would, you would never walk away thinking that race is biological. You would understand um, all of these, all of these larger contexts contributing to our health inequities or racial health inequities. And I thought this graphic was also really good. Um, this is Boston Public Health Commission's framework. And I think oftentimes we talk about all these social determinants of health, and you can see that list in the middle. Um, but rarely, rarely did I hear in my training anyways, um, you know, the racism piece that's underlying every single one of those, which then affects health outcomes. Um, and yes, yeah, so just to go back, race is not the risk factor, it's actually racism that is the risk factor. So we're going to switch gears a little and talk about medical tools and algorithms. I'm wondering if y'all don't mind being on the slide though again and, um, and answering this question. Race and medical tools algorithms that we teach about or use clinically is something I didn't even consciously realize that the tools were racialized. I knew race was a factor, but never questioned how it was factored into the tools. I've known it's a factor and I take that into account by using modified version. So um, most all of you put what I what I would have answered before is I knew race was a factor, but never really questioned how it was factored in tools. Like I can't believe I used some of the ASCVT, I used the VBAC, I used so many of these calculators without even questioning or wondering how race was factored into the tools. Um, so that's why we're we're talking about this today. So thank you for, um, for those of you who did. Um, so EGFR, um, I, before I go through it, I'm just wondering if any of you want to volunteer, um, if you understand the evidence base for race-based practice and kidney function, or if you want to share what you know about why race is included in the EGFR equation. So basically, as you all have seen this, you have this in every most every system, EGFR for non-African American, EGFR for African American. and um, it's different. Those numbers are different, right? And that kind of affects where we put people on the CKD scale. Um, so the two different formulas that are primarily used are the MBRD and the CKD EPI. In both of them, you can see it takes into account creatinine, age, gender, and then the race. If black, you multiply. There's a correction factor times 1.2 in the MBRD, and in the um, CKD EPI, it's 1.16, so it's a little bit less. But the bottom line is that race is being used as a proxy for muscle mass. And it's based on this assumption that African Americans have more muscle mass than people of other races. Now, where did that come from, right? Um, so you can see those, the 1.2 and the 1.6 there. So where did that come from? Um, this talks about how race was measured in the MDRD study and where that assumption came from. So in the MDRD study, it's a cross-sectional sample of 197 black participants and 1,300 white. Ethnicity was assigned by study personnel without explicit criteria, probably by looking at skin color, which we all know you can't necessarily just look at somebody and you know the race or whether they're mixed or whatnot. Um, and then explanation for the use of race. So that was already one week, study, right? It was not self-identified race ethnicity. It was just they didn't explain how they even identified race. But then the, re the MDRD study, um, 1999 paper says, on average, black persons have greater muscle mass than white persons. And what they base it off of is three pretty old studies with very low sample sizes. 
47 black belts, all from friends or staff at New York Laboratory, 1970, 59 black children in one small town in Louisiana, and 30 black belts at one hospital in London from 1990. I mean, I just think about this and I'm like mind blown because I think about all my elderly black patients who are frail and have very low muscle mass. And I have been for years using their EGFR based on this correction factor that says that they have an increased muscle mass. Or I might have like my white patient who's a bodybuilder and not using that correction factor. So the bottom line is it's, it's a really poor proxy and it's been used everywhere. So this really talks about how the current EGFR equations disadvantage our black patients and communities. Um, so if you look at the top, if somebody, if you identify them as black or they identify as black, you're, they're gonna have a higher EGFR regardless of which equation you go with. They're gonna get higher antibiotic dosing. They're gonna um, be on the transplant wait list. Um, for or they'll, they'll be longer till they get on the transplant wait list on the transplant list um i refer those patients later to nephrology because it's not till my patients dip below an egfr 60 that i'm referring them to nephrology right um and then also dialysis initiation um they will get started in dialysis later and so you can just see how that can um that can change things for our patients so it can cause problems with transparency and restrict access to care in some cases um, there's a really good paper called Hidden in Place Science in the New England Journal of Medicine that came out last year, last fall, about a year ago. I recommend you look at it. It's excellent. It goes through all of the different fields and brings up calculators, how race is used, and the inequity that could be resulting by using race. So you can look at the VBAC calculator, predicts a lower chance of success if the person is identified as Black or Hispanic. Um, it may dissuade clinicians from offering trials of labor to people of color. Um, you have the stone score, the UTI calculator in urology, a lot in oncology. There's a whole other page that I didn't include here. The FRAX tool, which I use all the time also. And then I just wanted to bring up this barometer. So in the US, barometer is used for a correction factor. It's like built into those barometers for persons who are labeled as black. Um, I don't know where the Asian one comes from, but I know that at least the black one comes from Dr. Cartwright's footprint that's still in medicine today. Um, that was based on his bias poor studies. So the bottom line is like race has been used as a shortcut. It's a convenient proxy because it's easier to use um, than more important factors like muscle mass, enzyme level, geography. And um, there's so many conditions I think back to med school that we learned and they're just racialized. So I, when I think sickle cell disease, I think of a black patient. When I think cystic fibrosis, I think of a white patient. And while that might be true that there are more black patients in the US, with sickle cell, it's not because there's a biological difference between black people and white people. It's actually because race, the way we're taught it, race is actually a proxy for geography. So those that live in malaria endemic areas, sickle cell trait is actually a protective factor against malaria. So anybody that comes from geographic countries that live kind of like along the equator, so a lot of Middle Eastern countries, Southeast Asian countries, they have higher rates of sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease. Um, but because in the US, most of our um, black population were enslaved, came from Africa, that's why we have, um, came from countries where the sickle cell trait was a protective factor. That's why we have um, associated kind of that together. So just keeping in mind what really we're looking at versus race. So rather than looking at race, it would be more important to look at the evidence-based things like the family history, the patient's history, um, and even cystic fibrosis, which is underdiagnosed in people of African ancestry because it's thought of as a white disease. So just kind of trying to take race out, out of the um, equation in terms of using it as a shortcut. So the other thing is rather than a risk factor that predicts disease because of something genetic, race should be conceptualized as a risk marker of vulnerability, bias, or systemic disadvantage. Because it, you know we're not saying we shouldn't use race, we should absolutely use race because look at the racial inequities we have in our country. Um, but we should really reframe the way we think about race. So the problem is um, it's still in the water. So current free clinical medical education um, re really inaccurately employ race as this biological value. More than 75% of medical students report feeling inadequately prepared to address race in medicine. And um, some students and myself over the past few years have done a curriculum analysis and a survey of Georgetown's curriculum and students, which show some similar results. And I'll just show one of the 
one of the slides take away. So they looked at all the 400 lectures in one year um, for at Georgetown and looked at how race was used by lecturers. The big takeaway is every about 50% of the time that race was mentioned, nothing was explained. And so basically just like an epidemiological stat or a prognostic factor was thrown out, like African-Americans are at higher risk for this, but there's nothing explaining why um, or the context isn't explained. So that allows students to make their own assumptions as to, what, as to whether race is biological or social. And that inaccurate understanding, as we know, can lead to uh, biases and worsen racial health inequities. Um, these are some sample quotes that the students pull from the lectures. Um, so I just want you to take a minute and look at the quotes. And then if, um, if anybody would be willing to tell me maybe the difference between the quotes on the left and the quotes on the right. For monitoring. I mean, that's exactly it. We use the quotes on the left as kind of like poor examples or teaching examples um, for, for ways that you can improve for as, when we're doing this with our faculty, like ways you can improve your lectures. And the ones on the right are like good examples and ways that it, it is better to talk about race when teaching students, right? Or teaching residents. Um, and then I just want to like think about, you know, like that first team, Mr. Jones is a 58 year old Hispanic male. Like, what does a Hispanic have to do with like with? with anything, right? It, and I talked about how I use this all the time in my opening line. I was thinking during residency how we did all the time, like, you know, 52-year-old African-American female or wh whatever it may be. Um, so one thing we're trying to move away from is using race in the opening line. And the place that you can use it, at least in your clinic notes, where it's more recommended is in the social history where you can ask, you can, you can say patient self-identifies as this race or ethnicity. Um, so it doesn't mean we we shouldn't know it, and there are there are reasons why you might want to know it. But the bottom line is, it really doesn't affect the, the care um, in that opening line. So there's there's no reason to mention it. So we're trying to move away from that. Um, the second quote, just want to say, I mean, this one is has been so confusing to me. I remember even before, but I absolutely practiced it. I was like, oh, for my black patients, I would not start them on ACE inhibitors because of the study that shows they're not as effective in monotherapy for black patients. But the bottom line is like, how black does a patient have to be for you to not stop to start them on a calcium channel blocker rather than an ACE inhibitor? Like, what about our patients who are half black, half white? I mean, it just like, when you really think about it, you're like, wow, this really doesn't make sense. Um, and the thing is these studies identified a difference and it doesn't mean there wasn't, there's, as you know, there's so many other factors. It's not a biological difference. There could be so many other factors contributing to why these inhibitors were not as effective in black individuals, like all these other social factors, right? So that's why um, now I don't really take that into account. I mean, and you also can't just look at your patients and determine necessarily what race they are. I mean, they're, like if you look at Brazil, Brazil has people with black skin color, people with white skin color, right? So, I mean, race is such a complex topic that to just like dumb it down into these like black and white boxes um, doesn't really make sense. And I really like the celiac disease quote because it really gives the geography in, in one out. And the other thing we did was we um, gave surveys to our faculty and students. Um, I just want you to look at the first three questions where we asked, um, how do we define race? Kind of, and then the second question is uh, one of the questions I asked you in the beginning, to what extent is there biological or genetic basis race? And to what extent are racial health disparities due to biological differences? And we asked a whole bunch of other questions around race, medical education, and um, the environment at Georgetown. But um, what I just want to show you is some of the faculty results, since we were talking about kind of how faculty teach around it. Um, so the vast majority of faculty think there is at least a small biological or genetic basis for race. Um, the preclinical faculty were nearly twice as likely to respond not at all compared to other faculty roles, which we thought was interesting. And, and then when you ask about racial health disparities due to biological differences, so um, more than 35% of clinical faculty responded with at least somewhat of a biological explanation for racial health disparities. So you can see why it's important for us to have these discussions um, because you're working with clinicians who um, are really unsure and haven't talked about race. And that includes many of us, like me, before I started looking at this a few years ago. Um, and that's where a lot of these, um, these myths or stereotypes kind of get perpetuated without us even realizing it or knowing it. And thinking like our one of our deans who thought that, um, you know, that the 
COVID mortality differences were due to some genetic predisposition. So um, I'm going to just fight through this because I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. But um, the bottom line is um, when you leave race unexplained, it leads, leads to students interpreting the information without any critical thought. And then I think by doing that, we also um, remain complicit in systemic racism because we're kind of ignoring ongoing contributions to racial health disparities, right? And we're just, you know, failing to address race as a social and political context and for leaving it undefined and biological, we're complicit in the system. There's another really good paper that uh, came out January of this year, Misrepresenting Race, the Role of Medical Schools in Propagating Physician Bias. So similar to what we found in our study, we looked at different ways that race is misrepresented in preclinical curricula, and they give like all these examples. Um, and then I wanted to end with just so you know, you're like, Dr. Kresge, you presented all of this information, um, information to me, so what can we do about it? So I wanna just talk really briefly about how we can move towards race conscious medicine and, and use race more thoughtfully in our clinical care and in our teaching. Um, so one of the, this is from the paper that I just mentioned, one of the, another paper, sorry, that came out last fall. Um, I thought that this was really good because it really talks about the, the, the one at the top is the model that I've been referring to that's been used, right? So race is ill-defined and inferred to be biological. So you can see in research, it affects, um, they, you know, studies link race with biology, right? In medical education, racial groups are understood as inherently diseased. Um, and biological concepts of race are reinforced. And then in clinical practice, you have bias and stereotyping, or you use those racial algorithms, right? And that reduces the racial health inequities. Whereas if you start to define race as a social and power construct, you, you have to think about systemic racism or structural racism. And we have to talk about the consequences of that on health. And we, then we have to talk about solutions, right? To, to solutions to the structural determinants of health, and that can lead to a reduction in health inequities. Um, I just want to say it's changing, not just here at Georgetown, Metstar, but across uh, everywhere. AMA, recognizing race as a social, not biological construct. Double AMC, working on this too, to eliminate racism in medical education. CDC director last year declares racism a serious public health threat. And um, re this is the National Kidney Foundation. Um, task force reassessing the inclusion of race and diagnosing kidney disease. Um, this is a screenshot. I did my residency at UCSF, and this is one of my colleagues who posted this actually two years ago, I think. And I was like, wow, that's that's awesome. But not just at UCSF, it's across um, University of Washington, MGH, Brigham, Beth Israel. Um, they are they have all taken race out of EGFR in their systems, and they've dealt with it in different ways because it is tricky. It's not that simple to just like Change, change it, but um, at UCSF, they've changed it to is EGFR flow muscle mass, EGFR high EGFR muscle mass. So you can just look at your patient and get a, just follow if they're low muscle mass or high muscle mass and be able to then um, use the EGFR more appropriately. And um, this is um, something I found on the House Committee's Ways and Means, and I, this is Chairman Richard Neal, and I was really impressed because basically even like um, from uh, at, at this governmental level, they're really talking about clinical algorithms and the Committee on Ways and Means is asking all the professional societies to reevaluate the use of race in clinical al algorithms, basically what we were talking about. And this is from last fall, and they cite that paper um, hidden in plain sight from the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, when I gave this talk initially, um, I, the second time that I gave it to some faculty, one of the ob guy doctors said they went to the VBAC calculator and now it says a new calculator without race and ethnicity is under development. So the bottom line is changes are being made and across the board where everybody's recognizing that this leads to unsafe and equitable healthcare when we use race algorithms. Um, I'll share my slide deck with you all. The next uh, few slides are just resources, really a whole bunch of papers that talks about better ways to um, teach or like standardized language used to describe race, ethnicity, and suggestions for improvement, how to contextualize racial differences and disease burden, like ways to really be more thoughtful about this. Um, that's one paper. This is another paper that talks about how to be inclusive in, in teaching and pictures that we include in our lectures and language that we include. 
acknowledging the limitations of research. So I might start to talk about the JNC guidelines, right, with my residents, but acknowledging the limitations of research and how um, how race might be used, like, you know, in, in, in some of these things, especially when we're talking about like um, hypertension based treatments. Um, this is another paper that goes over different calculators, talks about how race is used, talks about their rationale for using race, but the potential harm, and then how you can change your approach. So when you're using ASCVD or when you're using the PFDs or the FACTS or BMI, risk for diabetes. This is um, this came out of UCSF. It's kind of like, um, again, another teaching tool. If you're giving a lecture, it's a one-page like, checklist to go through like when mentioned is race contextualized and it says yes no and then you kind of go through this algorithm and um and change things so this is another great um bias free checklist which we might be using across for all our lecturers and clinical and preclinical at georgetown um dr amy cruz from bonnet city upstate came up with this but it basically it goes beyond race which is really important because there's so much intersectionality but, but it goes into like disability and gender and other things to just make sure you're being inclusive in the way that you're um, teaching. Um, this is addressing race, culture, and structural inequality um, for revising teaching cases. So anyways, a lot of resources out there to learn how to better talk about race and use it. But for you all, um, recommendations, and this is from another document UCS have put out, they're like 10 years ahead of us in all of this. Um, this is the stuff we're trying to do here at Georgetown, they were doing 10 years ago there. but. Um, Seek out literature on research and research on critical race theory. Um, teach yourself the question when you hear race used in clinical medicine. Ask questions of those around you who are using race-based medicine. So again, question in a, obviously in a respectful way, but really ask, like, can you explain this to me? Because I don't understand um, why race is being used or how it's being used here. Seek out anti-racist trainings and organize for change. And I'll give you an example of one of your, well, I guess one of your colleagues, one of our fourth year medical students who's now an intern uh, Franklin Square. Um, I've been giving these workshops since last fall, but in the spring, he's like, you know, can we approach MedStar to see if we can talk about EGFR and race and why race is used? And so, because of him kind of pushing for that, we got together all the nephrologists, um, part of the Nef MedStar system, and had a meeting. And they agreed that we really need to reevaluate the use of race. So, we're in the process of doing that across MedStar. Um, so it will take some time, but at least those conversations are being had. And it was really one of our fourth year medical students who, who pushed for that. Um, so again, a, a vision for it. So we really need to talk about how racism has shaped science, medical advancements, tools, and also acknowledge that race is not this simple fixed topic. It's, it's complex. And when we use it in medical teaching, we just need to make that clear that it's not this fixed, simple topic. Um, we need to work towards thoughtfully phasing out racial terminology without context in the biological sciences. Um, but we should take into account the consequences of racism, and we need to continue talking about race as a political or social category and study racism to understand how structural inequities and discrimination produce health disparities between groups. Um, so that's all I have. This is just a slide on kind of if we're talking about anti-racism medical education. I only talked about one small part of it, race is a social contract, but there's so many other things that need to be included um, as we're talking about these things, including acknowledging and de deconstructing privilege. Um, and I just end it with saying my, my interest in these topics um, has been, I mean, I'm a daughter of immigrants, but I'm somebody who has absolutely benefited from all the structures of so many of the structures of oppression in this country. So I'm kind of coming at it from a, from somebody who's benefited from many of these um, structures of oppression and, and hoping that we can we can change these structures so that everybody can benefit from them and not be hurt by them.